Greetings, Music 595 students, score analysis students here at Brigham Young University. I'm glad to be with you one last time via the miracle of video. You know me, uh, my native cheery temperament, to use that phrase that Joseph Smith used about himself. Uh, I like to look on the bright side. And so here in the midst of our COVID-19 pandemic, I have found a silver lining, and that is for maybe the first time in my life, I'm actually being told not to go get my hair cut. And so it's, it's getting kind of to where I like it, at least the way I was raised. <laughs> and I wore this shirt today, a t-shirt with Frank Zappa on it, because this fact of being prevented from getting a haircut reminded me of a line from the song Who Needs the Peace Corps from the Mother's of Invention album. Uh, Mother's of Invention, the group led by Frank Zappa in the 1960s and 70s. And uh, the line in the song Who Needs the Peace Corps is, oh, my hair's getting good in the back. And it's kind of how I'm feeling right now. My silver lining. I'm also wearing a t-shirt because I want to have the glare of my whitened, uh, more whitened than usual at least, forearms, reminding you that, and actually assuring you, I guess, that I am doing my part to stay indoors and not go outside, except occasionally up to my office to clean out the books and other stuff that's there because I'm retiring, as you know. All right. So today's topic is tablature. Uh, I thought I would start by showing you this. This is a, a little fraction of an upright piano. And you can see that here's the key. I press it down and all this amazing, intricate physical transfer of energy is taking place to have just the right proportion of my pressing that key be transferred to this hammer hitting, in this case, it's not a string, it's representing a string, this little pole of metal. Now, I mention this in part because it does have to do with tablature, but also because, you know, when people ask me, sometimes it's, a, it's kind of a university thing, sort of a bureaucratic thing, do you, do you use technology in your teaching? Well, aside from the iPhone that I'm using to do this lesson, uh, I do use technology in my teaching. In fact, my first answer is always, you mean like these reading glasses I'm wearing? Because that's some pretty amazing technology in itself. And I sometimes will mention the piano because this is pretty incredible technology. It's not just, it's just not that digital technology that everybody thinks is what technology is, okay? It's a pretty amazing device. So if that little pole of metal there were actually the string on the piano that you would hit with a hammer when you read the note that is, let's say, the C, the second space of a bass staff. That C on the page is, as we talked about with alphabetic writing, it is a symbol that represents a sound that represents meaning. If, however, I just told you, hit this key on the piano and not say to you what pitch it is or anything, I'm just telling you, here's where to hit it. That's what all you need to know, okay? Uh, that's a kind of tablature mentality. I've given you this handout, a uh, series of pages on tablature. And you can see here, I've nicely <laughs> hand inscribed this. Here's our definition of tablature. It's different from the kind of note head and staff line based scoring that we've focused on most of the time in this course. So tablature, I'm just reading here, 
notation of instrumental actions without pitch symbols. Plucking, blowing, hitting, pressing, strumming. You've seen some of this already in here because we looked at ukulele chord graphs, you remember, in popular sheet music, which then mutated over time into guitar chord graphs. And so what, what you would see there is, you know, the, the, the nut, so-called, of the instrument represented at the top, and then you'd have these frets and strings there, and it would show you fingering, and it would say, you know, play there, press those strings down, and this is the chord you need. This, by the way, is an E chord, but it's not telling you the notes of that chord. It's just saying, press these down, and that will give you the sound that fits this particular tune or this place in the song, whatever it might be. So you've seen tablature of that sort, but I want to look at uh, a little bit more elaborate version of that. Now, first of all, if you, if you look online, to find, say, the lead guitar solo from this particular song or that particular song, maybe a hit song, maybe an obscure one, you'll find it not written in note heads on staff lines. Typically, it's written in tablature. I have a friend who used to work for the Gibson Guitar Company, later broke off, formed his own guitar company, uh, but he is an expert at transcribing guitar solos from recordings. He writes everything in tablature, because that's the way it's done. If you read Guitar Player magazine, that's what you'll find there and so forth. It's not written in staff lines and note heads, but tablature. It says, here's the string, you put your finger on this fret, on that fret, and so forth all the way through. That's how you play it. That's tablature. Now, the, the roots of this historically are in lute tablature. And I want to take you through some examples of that. Going back to this opening page, you see we've, we're dealing with strings and then keyboard and then blowing or wind tablature. So this first one, strings, we're dealing with lute. And this page, the next there, you can see it gives you a rundown of lute and keyboard, a little sort of a weird keyboard tablature here, and then some harmonica tablature, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. Well, the lute had typically six courses. Now, a course is a pair of strings, and that pair of strings is tuned in unison or at the octave. It's very similar to what you have in this 12 string guitar that I'm holding here. You can see that the lower strings, that is lower in pitch, it's basically an octave there, it's not a great octave, but, uh, and then the highest string, which is at the bottom here, that's in unison, right? So if you're representing tablature, you would show, at least in lute tablature, you would show the six courses as horizontal lines on the page, and you would have the, um, the numbers in Italian lute tablatures telling you which fret to press down on which string. So let's have a look at that. That's a page of Italian lute tablature. You see you've got the six courses there. It's telling you with numbers which fret to push down on. And that will give you the note you want. There's nothing here telling you what the pitches are, okay? Incidentally, the rhythm is shown through just these simple notations on the top. and. Maybe you can deduce this, but I'll just tell you so you don't have to work that hard at it, that the, the note values given are what's being played by that string or those strings at that time, and it will be that note value until you're told otherwise. So you can see here we've got 
we've got two, oh no, we've got a dotted half note, right? And then a quarter note, and then half, 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 that's being played until you get to a quarter note being shown. And then you play quarter notes until you get some other note value. That's how the rhythm was shown in this Italian lute tablature. French lute tablature, same concept, the layout of the courses of the lute, Okay, these six paired string set, <laughs> paired st sets of paired strings, okay, the courses. And uh, the frets are not given numbers, but are given letters. So it's, a, it's quite a different look. So A is an open string. Uh, by the way, in lute, uh, ta Italian lute tablature, a zero is an open string and then one, two, three after that. And A, the first letter of the alphabet in the French lute tablature is an open string, and then B, C, D, and so on up the string. Now, every string has the same letters, just as in Italian lute tablature, every string has the same numbers counting up. This is different from German lute tablature, which is really quite strange. It's... Uh, you can see in this that there is no representation of the courses of the lute at all. No horizontal lines showing you that. Because in German lute tablature, there were a combination of letters and numbers and a few other symbols, each of which represented a specific course on the lute and a specific fret. So you would have a certain num certain symbols that would represent uh, frets to press down on for the lowest string on the instrument in pitch, et cetera. You know, then you'd have another set completely for the next string and on and on. And so you don't need to have anything there. You just have the symbols and that's it. You don't have to show the courses. What you have here you can see is, is just rhythmic values written on the top. These things that are beams across the stems of rhythmic values there. And that's German lute tablature. It's really difficult to learn. I guess if you were raised with it, it would seem easy. But uh, I had a lute years ago, bought it from Larry Green, who's one of our uh, Guitar, well, he's the principal guitar teacher at BYU, and, and I was a student with him. I, he sold me a lute, and he gave me some tablatures to practice on. They were French lute tablatures, and I just, it was really hard for me because I was so accustomed to the numbered uh, tablatures from guitar playing. It was real easy to transfer from one to the other. So, um, I'll miss, just mention this too. You know, other plucked stringed instruments nowadays also use tablature. Here's a bluegrass banjo book, and it's all tablature in here with the five strings of the banjo. One of the strings of the bluegrass banjo is an open string. It's not even fretted at all. It just is a, a droning string that just is always open, and then you're playing on the frets of the other four strings. It's a very old tradition. You should be able to recognize, though, the difference between Italian lute tablature, French lute tablature, and German lute tablature, I would say. Now, let's shift to keyboard tablature. Uh, this is a little bit messier. If you, if you go, if you Google keyboard tablature, you know, you'll get things like this, Wikipedia kind of thing, and you can see that keyboard tablature, it's not numbering the keys of the keyboard. It actually puts the letter names of the keys of the keyboard there. So it's, it, it is kind of in the realm of notating pitch. There are many different kinds of keyboard tablatures nowadays. I, I brought in this. This is sort of a weird old book. Do you see this? Dave Miner's famous play-by-ear songbook. Well, if you're playing by ear, why would you have a book? The whole point of playing by ear is not to be using notation. And the whole book is, is this. 
it's showing you what keys to press and so on throughout. Th these are not staff lines. These are representing keys on the piano by letter names. So it's kind of like staff notation in a way, because it is telling you pitches by their letter names. Uh, here's, a, by the way, a very fun one here, the little avant-garde. And this is for children to learn from. And it's got uh, sort of interesting tablatures, you know, where to put your hand on the keyboard and what shape to have your hand in and how to move along the keyboard and so forth. So that's a neat version of tablature. Historically, keyboard tablature was this way, as I have described it. You're being told the, the letter names of the notes to play. And so you don't need staff lines, you don't need anything, just the letters being written there. You'll, you'll see this happening even in uh, keyboard works of J.S. Bach, where he's writing on music paper, and you know paper was at a premium, it wasn't, wasn't really cheap then, and if you got to the bottom of the page and needed to write just a little bit more, but you didn't have any more staff lines there, he'd sometimes cram in a little tablature where he's just writing the letter names of the notes with rhythms there, and that's it. So he switches from the staff line notation to the keyboard tablature. In the early years of keyboard tablature, say 15th century, this is going way back, I think there's keyboard tablatures even from the 14th century, by the way. So the, the that, uh, you know, Machot era even. But typically 15th through 17th and front end of the 18th century, that's where we see a lot of keyboard tablature for organ, uh, harpsichord, especially. And uh, you'll, you, the earliest tablature you'd have different kinds of notation for different hands, some of the time at least. So you'd have our staff notation in one hand and then the letter names written in the other hand. Then as time went on, it was one or the other. You'd either do all the letter names, that kind of keyboard tablature, or all the staff notation. This particular page next in your packet has this keyboard tablature up top, pretty messy there, and then a nice transcription of it in what we have as our kind of conventional staff line notation. So it was a mix of the two and then one or the other historically. I'm mentioning this in part because it's an interesting point of history. Normally when we think of moving from one state of affairs to another in history, we think that in the middle is some transition that there's a hybrid, hybrid of the two or a a missing link or something where you see the one transitioning to the other. But here we see that actually the mix was at the front and then it divided into the two others and eventually moved from all tablature to really no tablature anymore, keyboard tablature, but just the conventional staff-based notation that we think of nowadays. Now, both lute tablature and keyboard tablature in the Renaissance and the Baroque era are manifestations very often of what's called intabulation. And intabulation was making instrumental tablature out of vocal pieces. So you might have a mass or a motet that is uh, turned into tablature for a lute or a keyboard that would give you a, a way of hearing the music and, and, and a full score of it that's playable by one person rather than an ensemble of singers. If you want to hear what the music sounds like, that's how you would do it. In the same way that later we had piano transcriptions and beyond that we had recordings themselves. So we wouldn't have to actually have a live ensemble play the piece. So in tabulation, is really important in music history for two reasons. One is 
it reveals musica ficta. It reveals what's going on there. So when you see these accidentals being written into vocal, especially choral pieces from the Renaissance, we know those accidentals are there because of the intabulations. We see, oh, that's actually supposed to be a sharp. We know that because in the lute or the organ tablature, it has to specify what it is. And so the intabulation, the converting of vocal pieces into these instrumental tablatures revealed a lot of this chromatic stuff that was happening that's not in the original parts uh, for the voices. The other thing is that it reveals to some extent, ornamentations. Because on the instrument, you have to write out the notes. It's, and, and so you, things that are not written in the vocal might be specified in the instrumental to make it accurate. So in other words, the, these intabulations are transcriptions of what the music, uh, some of the things, the details, I guess I should say, that were actually taking place in the vocal music that were not revealed in the vocal parts themselves as written down. All right, the, the, the last area I wanna talk about is, is wind tabulation. And I mentioned two kinds there. Uh, one is uh, with multiphonics on woodwind instruments. This is where you want to blow and finger the instrument in a particular way so you'll get a couple of different pitches, maybe even three, it, it, sometimes with a difference tone involved, I don't want to get into that, but, but uh, it's to create dyads or chords out of a single solo line instrument. And you have to show that by saying, play this fingering and blow and you will get the sound I'm looking for. So here's a, a sheet in your packet that's showing you in this particular piece, this etude on timbre variation for saxophone, it's, it's the same pitch that you're normally blowing there, but you're, you're changing the pitch by these different fingerings that are shown you. The pitches that are sounding are not being shown you in the score. It's just giving you the fingerings that will create those pitches that the composer wants. The other type is harmonica tablature. And here's that page. We'll see another one or two coming up. With harmonica, it's a, it's a reed instrument that involves blowing out and um, sucking in on different holes in the instrument. So uh, it's producing different pitches. I didn't bring up harmonica here. Actually, I, I could play a little bit of harmonica. I played a lot as a teenager. And you get your full scale by blowing out and sucking in on the different holes in the instrument because it's giving you different reads of the instrument as, as you do that. Now, uh, that means that you have to show with harmonica tablature the hole, that's with a number, and an arrow up meaning blow or an arrow down meaning suck. All right, so uh, I give you an example of that here in your packet, you know, there are books of this kind of thing. It's just teaching you how to play all these songs and it's just giving you the holes and a little bit of maybe some syllables you might, you know, shape your mouth with and so on. But um, it, it, this would be, uh, if, I were, if I were playing way down upon the Suwannee River on a regular harmonica, a little diatonic harmonica, not a chromatic harmonica, it's a little bit different thing, but uh, I would be going <whistles> now I don't know if you could hear that, but i'm I'm alternating when I'm blowing out as I'm whistling and when I'm whistling in, and that corresponds to what I would be doing on the harmonica so. Okay, that's I don't I don't know if that's terribly helpful for you, but 
it was a fun challenge for me at that moment. All right. I want to show you some examples here just for exercises, okay? So here's, here's one. Take, take a look at this and, and uh, what kind of loot tablature is that? I'm seeing numbers there sitting on the courses being represented by the horizontal lines. So that's telling me this is Italian loot tablature. I should mention, by the way, that in both Italian and French, depending on who the publisher was, you might have the letters and numbers or numbers sitting on top of the courses or uh, that is above them or, or literally being superimposed on them as you have here. Well, let's see, what's next here? Oh, look at this one. This is one of the sheets that Larry Green gave me back when I had that loot from him. You can see here we have letters on the uh, courses of the instrument. So you'd see that and say, oh, French lute tablature. Ah, what's this one? That's woodwind tablature for multiphonics. This is actually the next page of the, of the etude that you saw before. Hmm. All right, I'm looking at this one here. My lighting's not so good here, but this looks to me like this is a French lute tablature, no? I'm seeing letters there on the courses. Ah, Chester Burnett, Howlin' Wolf, is, as he's better known. And look at this, sitting on top of the world. Do you see you've got the numbers there and the arrows up or down. There's some other inflections there where they're shaping the arrows. Is that where you're doing, oh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> That's not COVID-19. <coughs> That's me coughing because I was trying to make that harmonic sound. That sort of portamento stuff that you hear, particularly in blues harmonica. So here's one, you can see on this page, we have the French lute tablature and sitting above it is our regular staff line notation of the same music. This is one where it's given in both forms. It's not a mix of the two where you're playing one hand with one, one hand with the other. It's just showing you Okay, here it is in the tablature form, and then the staff line notation. That's a common thing you'll see uh, in some scholarly, especially editions and nowadays. Oh, here's one. All the good times are past and gone. Boy, that sounds like a blues song, doesn't it? And you can see this has several different kinds. It's got a C harp, that's harmonica, C chromatic, and then F cross harp. So those are different keys of the harmonic harmonicas you could use. One's diatonic in C, one's chromatic in C. The other one is an F cross harp. I won't explain that, but that's the type that you would use for a good blues sound. You, you pick an instrument that is at the subdominant level from the key you want to play in and you get more bluesy notes there, these so-called blue notes that uh, suit the style a little bit better. So, but you can see here you've got numbers and arrows going up and down. That's harmonica tablature. All right, well, I gotta show you one of these. This has rhythmic values and a lot of symbols, but no full horizontal lines crossing the page. This is German lute tablature. And you, uh, I don't know how closely you could see that, but it's got a, a mix of numbers and letters and so forth. And the strings are just stacked on top of each other in the various rhythms and so on. Here's one more. This is, uh, I don't know how well you can see this, but this is for two players who are sitting across from each other. And one is playing
well, one is playing here, and the other one is playing, sitting across in this direction. It's the same piece, but it's a duo, and it's just on the same open score page. This one is a French lute tablature, as you can see. Why? Because these are letters on the courses of the lute. There are a lot of other kinds of tablatures throughout the world. They're in your little packet that I gave you. I've got some here from Chinese stringed instruments here. I don't even know how to pronounce that, the Q-I-N. I won't even try. But, but look through these and see. It's telling you what kind of stroke on the instrument. And these are stringed instruments where you might be pressing uh, the string down to bend the pitch level. Uh, so that's a certain thing you're doing with one hand and you're plucking in a certain way with the other hand, maybe with the nails, maybe with the flesh of the finger, maybe by pulling it out with two fingers and so on. Very elaborate kind of tablature. And this is actually a bit of gamelan tablature created by our own Dr. Jeremy Grimshaw. The gamelan literature is normally not written down, but if you want to preserve it, rather than just an oral tradition, you might want to write it down so you can remember it yourself or so you can share it with someone else. And that's what he's done here, a piece that he learned by ear and, and teaches to others by rote. But in this case, he's, uh, he's written it down so that there's a record of what he's done. Well, tablature, <laughs> it's a really vast area in musical notation and there's still a lot of uh, tablature out there that has not been transcribed, I, I think, or it's, there might be some different interpretations of how to transcribe this or that into our conventional staff-based notation. Um, but be aware of that. It's, it's a whole realm that's so different from what we're accustomed to. And so here, uh, for example, the horizontal dimension does not represent time, but it represents an area of space on, say, a guitar fretboard or a lute fretboard and so forth. A very different orientation. And even the highs and lows are different because the lowest pitch on the instrument is at the top. The highest pitch is at the bottom, as you see here on my 12 string. Oh, that was a pretty bad E chord, but the best I could do at this hour of the night in my exile, my uh, sheltering in place, that I'm going to transcend now by sharing this with you on YouTube. I hope that's a decent introduction of tablature. It's the best I could do here on a Tuesday night in the midst of a, the great pandemic of the world. I think this gives you what you need to know, at least for an upcoming test. Nice to see you all, or imagine I'm seeing you all, and you're seeing this wonderful electron-based facsimile of me and my friend, Frank Zappa. <laughs>